As we have made our way through the letter of Hebrews over these past seven months, we've been greatly encouraged by the lessons that we've learned along the way. And for some of us, it has been perhaps an unexpected but a wonderful journey, a wonderful experience. We've been challenged by what the writer has brought before us as the Holy Spirit has ministered to us and enlightened us and directed us in our walk with Christ. But in several places along the way, the writer has stopped for a moment to warn us not to take the words of this letter lightly. Because these are words that come from God. He's cautioned us not to reject or even to diminish the importance of these words. Of the offer of salvation that God has given to us in Christ. So in chapter 2, he asks us, how shall we escape? How can we outrun the judgment of God if we neglect so great a salvation that he has offered to us? Do we really believe that we can ignore him and not face the consequences of that neglect? In chapter 3, he warns us, take care, be on guard, be careful that you do not have a, an evil and a wicked heart of unbelief and so fall away and abandon the truth and in unbelief drag become drag all the way into hell chapter 5 into chapter 6 the writer tells us don't misunderstand these things don't be deceived by the traditions and the ceremonies that are found in religion even in the Old Testament They were designed by God for a purpose. They were instituted by him to point us to Christ. But now they're no longer necessary. They're not necessary because Christ has accomplished his work for us on the cross. So now those things are just empty religious rituals. Religion. And religion without a relationship with Christ is Meaningless. A shadow. It's a shadow of what has been fulfilled in him. So the writer says, leave it behind and come to Christ. Then, Hebrews chapter 10, he challenges us to wake up to these things. Because the day, the hour for the return of Christ is drawing near. And judgment awaits those who have not come to Christ for salvation. Judgment that is sure. Judgment that is final. Judgment that is terrifying. Because God will unleash his fury. And he will devour those who have rejected his son. Those who see no value, no worth in the sacrifice of Jesus who gave his life for us. Those who have made God their enemy by discrediting his beloved son. And you can be sure of this, the writer says, God will set things right. It is a terrifying thing, he reminds us, to fall into the hands of the living God and to face his wrath. So remember from where you have fallen, and don't throw away your confidence in Christ. The weeping, the suffering, the pain, the sorrow, the persecution in this life will all give way to an eternity of joy with him forever. So have faith in in him. Have faith in Christ. All strong words of warning, to be sure. But beginning 
in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 12. We have what is perhaps the strongest warning found in the letter of Hebrews. Maybe the strongest warning that is found in the entire New Testament. The writer wants us to keep these things in perspective. Yes, we're experiencing difficulty. No one would deny that. But if we truly belong to Christ, then all of these challenges in our life come from the hand of our Father in heaven. Our Heavenly Father who loves us and who wants to help us. He wants to keep us on the right path. So He disciplines us. He corrects us in order to develop godly character in us. So all that we are experiencing should not be a source of fear for us. Think about the one whom we are dealing with. We're dealing with the God of the universe. And because of Christ, he deals with us as sons and daughters. He knows us. He loves us. And he invites us to draw near to him. For you, the writer says in verse 18, you have not come, proserkomai, you have not drawn near to a mountain that may be touched, selafao, to a physical mountain, like Mount Sinai. Remember how God dealt with the children of Israel on that day? When he gave them his law through Moses? In Exodus chapter 19, he told Moses to have the people prepare themselves. Because God was about to descend upon that mountain, and he was to speak to them. So Moses brought the people out of the camp, brought them out to meet the Lord. And they all stood at the foot of the mountain. It was to be a day, unlike any other day that they would ever experience in their lives. And as they stood there, waiting, the mountain began to fill with smoke, like the smoke of a furnace, dense, thick smoke, choking their breath. And the people had come, we're told, to a blazing fire, burning with fervent heat, blinding in its intensity because the Lord was there. And the mountain began to quake violently. The earth shook. It was like an earthquake. And the people, were told, were terrified. They were in the presence of God. And a thick cloud covered the mountain. They had come to darkness, we're told. Gnophos. To a fog. A dense fog. It was difficult to see. They had come to gloom, the writer says. Zophos. Deep. Dark. Blackness. Like the blackness of death. And the grave. And they had come to a whirlwind. Soela. To a raging storm like a hurricane with the crash of thunder and the flash of lightning all around them as the rain and the wind beat against them. And they had come to the blast, the echos, the deafening sound of a trumpet, ringing in their ears, getting louder and louder. But perhaps most frightening we are told they had come to the sound, the phone, the roar, the deafening roar of a voice of words, Rema, the voice of God speaking to them. Above everything else, this was a sound, we are told, which was terrifying to them. And it was such that those who heard the voice begged Moses, 
Karate Omai, they asked Moses to be excused. They wanted to leave. They wanted to go back to their tents. So that no further word, pro me, no, nothing else would be said to them. Nothing else would be added by God to what they had already heard, and nothing more should be spoken to them. They were overcome with fear at the presence of God as they stood at the foot of that mountain on that day. In Exodus chapter 20, it says they spoke to Moses and they said, we'll listen to you, but don't let God speak to us, lest we die. Even the leaders in the tribes of Israel, we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 5, were in fear. For they all could not bear the command, it says in verse 20. Pharaoh, they couldn't endure it. They didn't want to continue to stand in the presence of a holy God, even at a distance from him, knowing, it says in Exodus chapter 19, that if anyone even touched the edge of the mountain, that person would surely be put to death. But no hand was to touch that person. That person was to be executed by having rocks thrown upon him or shot through with arrows. And if even a beast, a, a, a therion, a wild beast, an animal of any kind, happened to be on that mountain or touched the mountain, we are told that that animal was also to be stoned to death. So terrible. For Beros, so terrifying was this sight, this uh, fantazzo, the power that was there, the power that was revealed to them, that was visible to them on that day, all around them. It was so terrible, we're told that even Moses, who spoke with God face to face, said, I am full of fear, ekphobos, I'm overwhelmed, I'm panic-stricken, and I am trembling. Entramos, I'm shaking, I'm violently shaking with fear. No wonder, we're told in 2 Corinthians 3.7, that what took place on Sinai that day, was a ministry of death in letters engraved on stones. As the moral law of God was revealed by a holy God to a people, a sinful people, who were incapable of keeping that law, and so they were all condemned, condemned to death. As they came there, as it were, face to face, with the God of the universe, with a holy God. So we come face to face with him as we look at his law. Brings us face to face with our sin, doesn't it? We see the sentence of death that is upon us. The sentence of eternal punishment. Is that where you want to be? The writer wants to know. It's what he asks the people. The readers of this letter. That's what he asks us. Would you like to be back at the foot of Mount Sinai? Would you like to be back in dead works? Back in fear of God? Fear of punishment? Fear of judgment? Remember, they were at the foot of a mountain in the middle of the wilderness. Where could they run? Where could they hide to escape the wrath of God? That's the point. There is nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. As we're told in Isaiah chapter 28, the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. The waters shall overflow the secret place, and all of our sin will be exposed. The bed is too short 
on which to stretch out. The Lord tells us there. The blanket is too small to wrap around us. We can't run. We can't hide. We can't hide from God. Just like the people couldn't hide from him at Mount Sinai. But you, the writer tells us in verse 22, you who know Christ, you have not come to gather around Mount Sinai to a place of fear. You have come to Mount Zion, to a spiritual mountain, to a place of grace, a place of forgiveness in Christ, the place where God dwells on the holy hill of Zion, the place where we no longer fear his wrath. We no longer fear to approach him because of the blood of Christ. All fear is gone. And so, the writer tells us, we come to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. We gather, not at the foot of a mountain. We gather in heaven. We come to a city, it says in Hebrews 11.10, whose architect and whose builder is God. We come to a place of peace and of safety, a place of rest, a place of life, not death, a place of joy, not gloom. Rejoice, the writer says, that your home is in heaven, and you have come to myriads, murias, to an in, immeasurable number of angels, who day and night and for all eternity never cease to worship God, to give praises to Him. You have come to the general assembly, the Pane Guris, to a celebration, a celebration that will last forever. You've come to the church, the ecclesia, the congregation, of those who've been called out of this world and have been called to Christ, the church of the firstborn, prototokos, those who inherit the blessings, the spiritual blessings in Christ. Those who are enrolled, the writer says, enrolled in heaven, apographo, those who have already been registered there, Our names are written in heaven. Rejoice, we're told in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, that your names are recorded there. Recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And we who know Christ will be there forever. You've come to God, the writer says. You've come to the judge of all. Yet in Christ... You can stand before him and you are not condemned. There is no barrier anymore. There is, there is no fear. There is no shame. There is no stain of sin upon you. Now there is no condemnation. We stand in the righteousness of Christ. And so we come. The writer tells us in verse 23, to the spirits of righteous men, to those who have gone before us, to those who are in heaven, those who lived, those who died in faith, but who are now made perfect, teleo, or made complete in Christ. We're one household. We're one family. So we come to Jesus. Our Savior, we will see Him face to face. We will be with Him forever. That's our hope. The one who is the mediator, the Mestithas, the one who stands in the middle, the one who stands to make peace with God for us. The author of a new covenant, the Diatheke, the one who has made an agreement for us with God. A new relationship, a new testament, a legal document, 
forever written in his blood. That's where we come. We come to the sprinkled blood, he says, to the erantismos, the blood which cleanses us, the blood which purifies us, the blood which still speaks to those who will listen. It speaks better. Kretan, it speaks in a more excellent way. It speaks stronger. It speaks louder than the blood of Abel. By faith, in obedience to God, Abel offered an animal sacrifice. He offered it to God. And he was murdered because of his obedience. But Christ willingly offered himself as a sacrifice. A sacrifice for our salvation, securing our forgiveness and our blessing forever. So the writer warns us in verse 25. He wants to know what we'll do with this information. It's a warning not to ignore the offer of salvation through Christ. Otherwise, where will we be? We'll be still standing at the foot of Mount Sinai in fear. In fear of the judgment of God. So see to it, he says. Black ball, carefully consider your response. Examine your life. Take care that you do not refuse and reject him who is speaking to you. It is God who speaks to us of these things. For if the nation of Israel did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that is the prophets, they warned them. Even Moses warned them. And when they warned them, they warned them of the judgment of God because of their disobedience and their sin. In fact, judgment did fall, didn't it, on them? Well, if that is true, how much less do we suppose we shall be able to escape his judgment if we turn away, apostrepho, if we turn our backs in rebellion against him? And we walk away. We just ignore him. We walk away in unbelief. He's the one who warns us, the writer says. He warns us from heaven. Remember. Remember what happened at the mountain in the wilderness. His voice shook the earth then. And the people were terrified. But now, now he has promised something else. He has promised this through the prophet Haggai. And Haggai 2.6, he says there, yet once more at the hapax, one last time, I will shake not only the earth, but I will shake also the heaven. The entire universe will be shaken. And this expression, the writer says, yet once more, denotes de lo. It makes this plain to us. It makes a, it clear that what will happen will be the removing, he says, the metathesis, the complete change, the upheaval of those things. Things which can be shaken. And he says we're speaking of the created things. Everything that has been created will be shaken. Everything all around us will be removed one day. As the Lord has said in Isaiah 13.13, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord the Lord of hosts, on the day of his fierce anger. So, why would we hold on 
to the things of this earth so tightly. They're all just dust. And someday they will blow away and be gone forever. In order that the things that cannot be shaken, eternal things, may remain, meno, continue, and endure forever. So what will our response be? Since we receive a kingdom, the writer says, verse 28, an eternal kingdom, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, a kingdom that will last forever, what should our response be? He says, let us show gratitude. Let us keep having an attitude of thankfulness for his grace towards us. A heart of gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service. You are estos la truo, that which pleases him. He searches our heart, doesn't he? He knows. He sees. He knows if we're serving him with reverence, yelabia, with devotion. He knows if we serve him with awe, delos, with holy fear. Is that how we serve him? That is the only way that is acceptable to him, the writer says. So as it says in Deuteronomy 4.24, the Lord, our God, is a consuming fire. And he will either consume the sin in us, if we come to him for forgiveness in Christ, or if we reject him, then he will consume us in our sin, and we will be lost forever. Strong, frightening warning. And our defiance of him will only bring disaster upon us. We can't run from him, can't hide from him, Remember, the bed's too short. The blanket's too small. We can't ignore his provision for our salvation in Christ. For it is to invite his judgment upon us. Ah, but to come to him, to come to him by faith, is to have life in him. Eternal life in him. Forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.